It seems smart to get the first milling done um, first before I move on to the metal work. That way this has a time to rest. Um, so yeah, next up is face jointing. Now that I have it cut down to size, down from 12 feet to a little over nine feet, these are gonna finish off at nine feet. So that makes it more manageable, but not just that, but uh, even at nine feet, I'm moving my planes just to make sure I don't knock them off as I go through my jointer. Uh, I really need a bigger shot. So, um, set up and was all ready to about start cutting. And then I checked the out feed. I didn't check the in feed and I don't have enough. So I think there's enough room. You gotta push the table saw just a few inches and then we should be able to get the in and the out feed. The jointer wasn't a problem because it didn't have the miter station in the way. Cameraman Robbie just saved the day because uh, I wasn't looking back here closest, but he said, hey, we're, when you were actually at the blade, um, wasn't it actually in the way of the saw in the way? Can we just turn the saw? Was able to just lift the fence out? Yeah, anyway, time to cut. You got everything laid out. Pick the tops or the sides that we want to be the top. I need two 20 inch benches out of this. This grouping is like 19 and a half. This is just under 19. I have an extra four inch board. And actually there was a whole other board, but it was a little wonky. So we just ditched it because we can do without it. But what we need to do is just rip this in half and that'll give me enough to add to both of these to get them a little over 20. So after the glue up and everything comes together, then we can cut them down to 20 as a single panel. One of the things I like about using this saw is it's really easy to gang cut on, meaning more than one piece, which is pretty common on miter saws. Total of four cuts, get all 16 pieces. The big trick is just making sure that all my pieces are flush so they all came out the same dimension. If that's all cattywampus on the end, it's not gonna work. And I'm really glad that it's not near as hot out here as it was last time I was cutting metal. Really need a metal shop. This is one of those like stupid obvious things that sometimes takes you a, a while to figure out. That is instead of sliding all these pieces all the way through to cut on the same side as I just did, I'll pull my measurement from the other end so I only need to slide a few inches over and that'll save me some time. Also, you notice I'm cutting with gloves. Generally as a rule of thumb, anything that spins, no gloves, but my hands are nowhere near this. Metal in the sun gets stupid hot and I don't want to burn my hands and my hands are nowhere near the blade, so. It's a risk I accept.
starting to come together. Got one section done, starting to weld on the second section. Had a little uh, delay. I burned up the uh, welding tip. Just happens. It's probably the longest I've made one last. Um, went through all my boxes. Couldn't find it. Went to the storage unit. Thought it was there for my trip to Kentucky. Couldn't find it. So ended up just having to go buy some more. Um, switched it out. Unfortunately, that fixed the uh, problem I was having. So ready to get back to it. Just got to finish up this with two more runners and then do the same thing with the other three pieces. There'll be two units like this, then weld up the, uh, the doors that'll flip down, then finish the wood. So there's a lot to do. There's, there's a lot. We're not close to done yet. During all the welding, we also welded up the door frames. Next is going to be using the expanded metal. We got to cut these pieces out, which are going to be the screen fill. So the door is uh, a door. For some reason, I have it in my head that cutting expanded metal with a disc is a no-no. I don't know why, because I don't know what else you cut it with, but I'm not sure. I'm a wood guy, not a metal guy. So I just put it over my two by four to make sure my disc can't like super dive or anything. Should be okay. Nothing's going to go wrong unless it does. I cut a spacer block to make sure I get my hinges the same, you know, distance on all of them so they look good and now I just use my magnets to make sure they're flush with the edge and I put one on both sides just to make sure you know I don't end up cattywampus I think that's the technical term make sure everything's uh, parallel or flush I think that's a slang and uh, yeah now I'll just put two little tacks on it run a bead do the other side and you'll see So as you saw, these have pretty much all come together. Uh, I just wiped everything down with alcohol again and dusted it off real well. And we did our best to make sure we got all the little weld spatter and BBs off the top of it. So when we put the tops down, um, they sit flush. For a finish, I'm just using some appliance epoxy. I've used this quite a bit on metal and I really like it. No endorsement, it's just uh, fairly, it's, you know, pretty good paint for metal because some metals or some paints don't really work all that great on metal. Just, uh, you know, as always, make sure you wear your respiratory protection and move anything. You don't want to get paint on farther away than I did probably. Now that the bases are done, we can jump back to the tops. I've already squirted off one end, so now I'm gonna come down here, cut both of these to length, lay out the shaper tape, use the shaper to get the C, get the slogan cut into here, and then we can get to all the uh, check presenters, which are gonna be the next video. So maybe you'll have some B-roll of that here, and make sure you subscribe if you wanna check those out. So I finished off that roll of shaper tape, and that's one complaint I see in the comments section a lot, is all that tape is so expensive. Well, I did just use like $10, $10 worth of tape. But for perspective, I put it on $500 worth of white oak, and I'm going to use a $2,000 machine to cut this. And trust me, I'm charging more than that for the project, so I just made sure I put that $10 line item in the quote when I built it so that way I could account for it.
Robbie got the rest of the shaper origin work done, routing out the inlay so we can do the epoxy fill. I kept working on the check presenters. Need to get the epoxy poured tonight. Only thing left to prep is to get all the tape pulled up. And this just kind of reminds me of being a kid and having to pull nails out of wood and then straighten the nails with a hammer to put in a bucket to rust and then stack all the wood in the basement to rot away because whenever we had a project, dad would go buy wooden nails anyways. So never really understood the point. Not sure if it was a uh, well-meaning desire to be thrifty gone wrong or if the point was just teaching us resilience and how to deal with a, uh, you know, stupid pointless taskings that were a waste of time that you have to deal with in your professional career. That was definitely a very good life lesson that served me very well as an army officer. Um, definitely saved me a lot of frustration just having already built that resilience. But anyway, made me realize that if this was his project and I was still a kid, instead of just throwing this stuff away, I'd totally be like having to peel it up super carefully then lay it out on paper or something to roll it up so we could use it next time because it's not free. But um, knowing full well, well that the adhesive would be totally shot and there's no way we'd get it off that paper or be able to lay it down, but still have to do it. I'm betting some of you guys had dads like that. And I bet some of you are that dad. If you're the latter, you don't have to admit it. But if you had that dad, I'd love to hear about it. The only thing left to do is a little bit of cleanup. Um, I'm going with a pretty opaque epoxy, so I'm not worried about making the bottom perfect. It did need just a little bit of chisel work to clean it up, but around the top edge, there's a little bit of fuzzies. So I'm just going to hit it with a very light pass of sandpaper. So that way you got a nice crisp edge with the epoxy. For the resin, I'm going to be using Total Boat Thick Set. I'm using a scale just to help me get my three to one ratio dialed in. Whoops, and it went off right before I poured, go figure. Fortunately, not much had really gone in. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and mix hopefully more than I need so I don't have to worry about color matching because the last thing I'd want is to uh, not have <laughs> the right color match. All right, I did 1,500 mils, which makes the math easy, three to one. I just add 500 mils of hardener to that resin. Or this might have been ambitious for this bucket. I've learned my lesson before. I think we all know what that means. So instead of trying to mix this up there, especially with it being so full, I'm gonna mix it down here. I want this pretty opaque, so adding a good bit of uh, mix all pigment, which comes in the total tit tint kit from Total Boat. And on low speed, because I don't want to introduce a bunch of bubbles, gonna mix this slowly. Thick set, as its name implies, is formulated for deep pours, and it can take up to 36 hours to fully cure. It should be sandable in about 12, which is fine because I have overnight, but tomorrow I need to sand this and get finished on it. Um, what I have noticed though is if you pour this thin, like eighth inch, quarter inch, something where you normally use a two to one, it can take a really long time, like you can take up to 36 hours to get to that sand sandable point. So to make sure I don't run into that issue because I'm doing a fairly thin pour on this, what I'm doing is leaving it in the bucket in a larger quantity to help get that exothermic reaction started. Once it starts, even if I, you know, start dishing it out and it gets thinner, it's not gonna stop. We just gotta get it started. Now, normally when you see it happening, the smoking and gelling and everything, it's too late to do anything with it. But with a IR thermometer, I can monitor the temperature of this. And once I see that it started to rise, then I can pour it. So my floor is 65, right after I mixed this, it was like 75 and it's 78, 79 now. So it's come up just a few temperatures. Once it hits about 85, 90, then I'll start divvying it out because then I'll know the process has started and it should be hard in the morning. Have this outside so the sun would help warm up the epoxy and get it curing. It's only a high of like 80 degrees today, so it's not too bad. Ran to the storage unit, get some more stuff out of the shop before the move while that was going on. And 
like two minutes down the road, it just started pouring. Tennessee thundercloud came out of nowhere that wasn't on the radar. Um, so pulled in like a madman, threw these in the shop, um, was able to get all the water off the epoxy. This one was pretty set. Unfortunately on this one, um, the epoxy had sunk some, so I had to top coat it. And I forgot that this one had been top coated this morning. So I rolled out the paper towels to try to collect the moisture off of it. And it was still all gummy. So um, started pulling them up, but it was pulling up too much of the epoxy and getting it all funky. You can kind of see here what it was doing. So the plan is just let it dry, let it cure, and then I'll just sand the paper towel and everything down till it's smooth. Um, these are too big to go through my planer. Um, mine's 18 inches. These are finishing at about 21. I do have a friend with a 30 inch planer. So depending on how sanding goes, I might try to take them over to him to have him plane them. That might do better. But it's straight knives, which don't do great on epoxy. So probably end up just sanding it all. I really need a bigger shop. All right, the epoxy, it's pretty hard. Two days later, once again, Merca is gonna save the day. I'm using the Abernet Ace HD, which is Abernet, just their lower grits and heavy duty. This is a 40 grit. So hopefully it'll really hog through those paper towels and stuff. So uh, it's pretty nice outside. I'm gonna drag this outside and uh, try to make it decent again. managed to get it all sanded down. It took like three or four hours. Fortunately with the Merca, like with my old sander, my hand would just be buzzing, but such low vibration. It's great. Anyway, um, so normally my go-to finish is Halcyon. Because this is a commercial project, I like to use a two-part finish. The two-part finish I use is General Finishes Conversion Varnish, which is clear. Before that, I use their armor seal to tone it. And also, this is going for some clients that I did all those big tables for. Got a really awesome video on making those tables. And that's how those tables were finished. So I also want to do these the same, just so they match more. So time for the beauty montage. So I forgot to get footage of screwing the tops on, but you saw the tabs that I welded. I just put screws as washers through there. Um, so now we're in Cincy, about to break all this down, get it installed and do some glamor. Anyway, thanks for following along. I hope you learned something, were inspired or at least entertained. If you feel like I earned it, please subscribe and hit the notification bell. And until next time, make time to make something.